All right, welcome everybody. Good evening. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Father David Subu on behalf of the Orthodox Youth Directors of North America. And we're very happy to have what I think will be our final webinar for 2022 with Father Turbo Qualls. Father Turbo is the rector of St. Mary of Egypt Orthodox Church in Kansas City, Missouri. Father Turbo is an iconographer and the spiritual director for the St. Elizabeth Sisterhood, which is an urban monastic community, and the Mount Tabor School of Liberal Arts, which provides classical educated rooted in the Orthodox tradition. Father Turbo holds graduate and postgraduate degrees in addiction studies and pastoral counseling with an emphasis in crisis response and trauma. And that is just touching the surface of all of his talents and gifts. Uh, he also has a podcast. Is the name of the podcast The Royal Path? Is that? Yes, that's correct, Father. Which you can follow on. Uh, I follow it on Spotify, but I'm sure it's on various other things on YouTube and so forth. Uh, so, Father Turbo, thank you very much for joining us tonight and uh, bringing us your your perspective on these things and your special topic tonight, as we can see, is let them serve you the proper role of emotions in the life of an Orthodox Christian. Um, I have I have uh, one teenager left in my house, and I can tell you I have I have no idea why emotions should be discussed when talking about young people. I mean, <laughs> they're they're the most even keeled individuals I've ever met. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Greetings, um, everybody. Um, I, and I don't know, um, Father, if <clears throat> I, if this is proper, but I do um, like interaction during lectures as well. I don't necessarily require or need um, questions to come after the presentation. Sometimes it can add a lot. So I'm just want to throw that out to everybody. But I don't know if that's um, out of your housekeeping. So you you heard them, folks. If you have questions, feel free to chime in in the in the Q and A boxes, and we'll field them live. Great, great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you again, Father, for this opportunity. Um, so, I guess Father's introduction you know, is is sufficient, but um, I do want to add a little bit of my background um, to give you guys. Um, maybe a little bit of, I won't say comfort, but maybe just to exhale a little bit in regards of why um, I would even be able to talk about this. Um, so I have eight kids um, and father's way ahead of me in the sense that my oldest is 20, my youngest is 16 months, but obviously, um, you know, I'm fielding that in real time right now. The other thing is, you know, I, I remember being a teenager myself. I remember being, um, young and, and finding my way. But more importantly, um, I've spent most of my adult life and most and all of my time as a Christian first as an evangelical youth minister and now I'm an Orthodox priest with a heart, as we would say, um, for the spiritual development of, of young people. And so um, I, I chased education to equip and to affirm and to clarify my life experiences. It's not the other way around, if that makes sense. So um, what I've learned in life um, and the way I've tried to couple that with God's help with my education, um, I think you'll find interesting because so much of the life experience of, of all of us um, is kind of rooted in those very confusing and at times difficult years as a teenager, and you're being moved um, by forces that are unaware to you. And I can say kind of unequivocally, um, if I had had a, um, a, a different kind of seedbed, I think some things might've been different. Now, I don't regret anything that I've gone through because you know God's baptized my experiences However, um, there are some things that don't have to be as painful as, as they were. And this is what I'm hoping is that um, for those who are here um, and those who would listen to this, that it will give you some tools to really um, be of an assistance to, the, to young people as they're struggling with these things because it matters. And a lot of times, you know, especially if you're living with a kid or working with a kid in their community and 
we can sometimes become numb to the turbulence of their emotional states, but that's a really big mistake to underestimate that because those moments um, can make the difference between entering into a crisis and coming out of it or entering into a crisis and never leaving. And I have experience with people who have kind of been in perpetual crisis now because they weren't yanked out um, soon enough. And then this life of being kind of in crisis, these, these states just kind of be, became a perpetual thing. So all that to being said, I hope that um, this will give some insight into my motivations and, and where I'm coming from, not just the kind of information I'm presenting to you guys. Okay, let me see here. So um, just an overview of what the lecture is gonna be. Um, we're gonna ask the question of why emotions are important to Orthodox Christians. Um, what emotions are really? and how we're to reconcile the contemporary definition with our patristic tradition. This is kind of what I was talking about in regards of if I had a different seedbed, if I had had something that could point to my life experience as a human being that was connected to kind of like a broader picture. Didn't really have that. Orthodoxy provides that for young people, but I think we need to, to know how to articulate that ourselves and then to young people. Um, how can our tradition help us understand our emotions, their impact on us, and how to put them in their proper place? And the way we'll do this, we'll break this up into the need to translate the faith is the first thing. Uh, second thing is the finding of terms. And the third will be application. So let's start off. I know um, everyone's going to know so much of what I'm going to say. And so it's tonight may not be necessarily about new information, but a different approach. I kind of look at it like this. Um, don't want to scandalize anybody, but you know uh, I'm a fan of combat sports. My dad grew up watching boxing. My dad taught me how to box, and um, I will tell you that you know boxing is boxing. You know you have two hands and you kind of try to punch the guy. However, what makes a great boxer is what they call his angles, and the angles all about how you approach and how you move. So we may know. And you, I'm sure all of you will know the things I'm presenting, but hopefully what I'm trying to give you is a different angle to make, make it hit home with the person that you're trying to minister to, if that makes sense, okay? So I'll kind of move forward. And again, if there's anything, any questions, please ask. So let's start off with the fall, okay? The fall was a traumatic event uh, that was induced by idolatry, led to division and ultimately death. This cycle is now repeated in the life of every human being. Um, the young, really all people, um, but young people find themselves in the world, which is like the garden, and are tempted to seek fulfillment outside of God and his timing. The key thing here is the timing portion, actually. Um, and this cycle results, results in a person against God. These are the, the, the falls, the, the, the many falls and the aspects of division that were subsequent from the fall that we experience. Person against God, a person against creation nation against nation, you know, racism, all this stuff, man against woman. And we don't even have to think about it in a kind of broader sociological term. Let's think about it in the home unit, you know, where there is strife between a mother and a father, brothers and sisters, you know, aunts and uncles, whatever. But ultimately man against himself, man within himself, the individual within himself. And this is the final aspect. This is experienced as fragmentation and the disordering of our being, body, soul, and spirit, right? Here's a wonderful quote from Father Stephen Rose. He says, the distinction between soul and spirit does not mean that these are separate entities within human nature. Rather, the spirit is the higher part, the soul, the lower part of the single invisible part of man which as a whole is usually called the soul. To the soul in this sense belongs those ideas and feelings which are not occupied directly with spiritual life, most of human art, knowledge and culture. While to say the spirit belongs man's strivings towards God through prayer, sacred art and obedience to God's law. In our day, the chief ingredient missing from this ideal harmony of human life is something one might call emotional development of the soul. It's something that's not directly spiritual, but that very often hinders spiritual development. 
It is the state of someone who, while he may think he thirsts for spiritual struggles and an elevated life of prayer, is poorly able to respond to normal human love and friendship. For if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Now, I will say to you, this quote is huge. And it's huge on a lot of levels. Um, so in my experience, um, you know, I've run um, depression and uh, trauma therapy support groups for men and women. Uh, I've run um, addiction clinics. I've, I've helped individuals with, with counseling for addiction. I helped individuals with counseling for PTSD, depression, uh, various psychological disorders, or like personality uh, disorder, things like this, things of this nature. Um, all the while, being an Orthodox Christian, being a priest, always looking for the opportunity to bring them the, the true medicine, which is Christ. Now, one of the things that's really important to understand is that for me, whoever I have in front of me, the, the main thing is for them to be healed, not necessarily for them to become a Christian. Now, I know this may be scandalous to some people at first, but please follow me when I, what I mean by this. And this also applies to people in your church, because we may often have young people that go to church because mommy and daddy are making them, but they haven't had a true conversion yet. So it, it absolutely applies. But what happens oftentimes is that if someone has an addiction problem and they can see that there's healing and hope in, let's, in, in orthodoxy, let's say, they see the beauty of the services, they see that the people there are kind and kind of quote unquote put together and they want that life, which is great. The problem that I found from experience and from my education is that there's certain um, back-end work that a person needs to do. Let me give one more analogy and I'll move forward. Um, if you've known anyone who has, or yourself, unfortunately, um, has suffered from cancer and needed chemotherapy, you understand that depending on your state of health, a doctor will often say, we need you to get you in better health before you can even start the treatments. Because the chemotherapy itself can kill you. Right. This is one of the big things I think we need to really begin to understand. This will start making more sense like as we move forward and start talking about translation. We oftentimes don't really understand um, the need to gently implement things for people. We often want to throw them a piece of steak when they're still really on milk. So what I've had to do many times is I've had people and I've made the mistake of not doing this they need to go to 12 steps before they really come into the church. I know that sounds really odd to some people, but the reality is, is that there's a certain measure of emotional development that a human needs to, to have before they can actually properly practice the faith if they've never been raised in it, right? Now I'm going to make this connection with many of our young people and, and forgive me, but I'm interested in results, not in necessarily, you know, uh, kind of polite conversation. And the reality is, is there's a lot of young Orthodox people who they've been in church their whole life, but, but there are things that have never connected for them. And so they come, to, they come of age and they, not, they may or may not be struggling with addiction, but they may be struggling with some real strong temptations, real strong emotional struggles. And then mom or dad or God mama, God papa says, go talk to Father Dimitri. Father Dimitri may not be prepared. And Father Dimitri is like, okay, let's confess. And that's great. And, and God works through the grace of the sacrament confession, obviously. But there isn't the kind of front end of young Johnny's health emotionally to really enter into this deep spiritual life. This is what Father Seraphim is talking about. This applies to converts, yes, but it applies in many ways to our young people. We got to remember that our young people, their attention, the, the church, and I don't just mean the, the church services, I mean the church, their time praying at home if they're praying at home, their time reading the scriptures if they're reading the scriptures, you know, that time compared to the time that they're spending on the internet with their friends, listening to music, it, it can't compete. So what we need to do is we really need to work on meeting them where they're at, I believe, and helping them first and foremost in these emotional areas so that when it is time to approach the depth and the meat of our tradition, they're able to digest it and not choke on it. 
Metropolitan Filaret, he says, unfortunately, in many good Orthodox Christian families, life is arranged in such a way that the parents consciously guard their children from contact with human need, sorrow, heavy difficulties, and trials. Such an excessive protection of children from sober reality brings only negative results. Children who have grown up under greenhouse conditions, separated from life, grow up soft, spoiled, and not well adjusted for life. Often thick skinned egoists, accustomed only to demanding and receiving, and not knowing how to yield, to serve, or to be useful to others. Life can break such people cruelly and sometimes punishes them unbearably. Often from their early school years, it is necessary, therefore, for those who love their children to temper them. Above all, there must always be one definite Orthodox Christian aim set before both parents and children, that children, while growing and developing physically, must also grow and develop spiritually, that they may become better, kinder, more pious, and more sympathetic. Now, I'm going to give somewhat of a generalization. I know there's exceptions. My parish is one of those exceptions. You know, we're, we're in a... a, a economically depressed, you know, we're in a poor neighborhood, you know, our, our community is working class. But generally speaking, the median for the Orthodox Church, our culture is, you know, people are blessed and they, they, they're coming from a context in which some of the cruel hard truths that the world has for them, they're often sheltered from. And I think that if we don't begin to face this, what can happen is when someone realizes that Johnny, Dimitri, you know, Sasha, whoever's having problems, they can be shocked. They're like, I don't understand. What's the problem? We've worked so hard to, you know, give them such a good life. But what you don't realize is in many ways that good life is, is crippled them to some degree. And so the way that we that I think we begin to mitigate this with youth is understanding that the area of emotional development is key because a child that does not have the ability to meet the challenges of life in an, in an emotionally mature way is in no, nowhere striving to be a Christian, let alone a functioning human being. And I think this is in many ways, you know, some of the decay we see potentially, you know, at least from my perspective in our society at large, because as we have engaged with, you know, we, we are blessed. Um, but, you know, I don't think anyone's going to be shocked to say that we don't have the resilience that our grandparents had. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that children, um, young people can't get married as young as they were earlier. And, and it isn't just because horse and buggy. It, it is because there is a, uh, there's a trade-off with with luxury, there's a trade-off that I think we need to be aware of. And it it's the cost of it is in many times our children are not as emotionally developed as they need to be. So St. Jerome, he says in regard to this, in regards of translating, um, he says that for I myself not only admit but freely proclaim that in translating from the Greek, um, render sense for sense and not word for word, except in the case of the Holy Scriptures when even the order of the word is mystery. Now, I think that what we need to really get a hold of is, is learning to translate the faith, really learning what a true translation is, being able to transmit it in such a way that the people in front of us, the youth in front of us are actually getting it. Because oftentimes we, we wish to preserve the integrity of certain um, understandings or vernacular for the sake of various reasons, <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, and I understand it, you know, if, if you're coming from a certain culture, um, you know, there's a desire to preserve it. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but if it's at the expense of your child getting the medicine to help them, um, it can be problematic. So what am I talking about? Well, we're going to get into this, but, um, Part of, I think, why uh, part of what the skill set God has given me as a priest is, is being able to take um, the tradition, in particular, the neptic tradition of, of the church and translate it to people so they can understand it. Because too often, Orthodox spirituality seems to be something relegated for academics and monastics when the reality is it's there to help human beings become whole. 
And um, if you don't speak to someone in a way they can understand, and then it doesn't really apply. So I would submit to you, the key thing in regards of translation is adding sincerity and simplicity. You have to be authentic. And one of the best ways to be authentic is to have your own experience and to know your experience, this praying through the things that you've learned. And then with God's help, there's a simplicity, right? When we try to make things too complicated, that's where we begin to lose people. So sincerity and simplicity is key. Once you have those two things together, you're gonna, you're gonna um, acquire a measure of accuracy. You'll be able to say something that's actually getting to the point of where someone's at. And that accuracy will translate into them being able to accept what's being presented. But this is, this is why I have this quote here from St. Jerome in regards of, you know, sense for sense versus word for word. You know, there's a rigidity. We have to be careful. We have to be translating, translating the essence of what's happening. So in this case, it's imperative for us to translate the faith to our youth so that they can understand the experiences of their lives in the light of Christ. So the two key things I'm, that will be the example here are logismi and equaling feelings and then passions equaling emotions. Now, these are approximations, right? That they're not exact. They are not exact. Um, and we must not, we can't become rigid in translating them. And as the individual progresses in their maturity, the fuller, more accurate the terms will become. So in other words, you know, you can't really say to Johnny, well, your passions, Johnny, like maybe you can, and maybe he'll nod because he's heard his whole life, but he doesn't really know what that means. But if you say to Johnny about his emotions, how they're affecting him in ways that he's not even understanding, it's not exactly the passions as, as the Neptic fathers teach, but at least you're getting Johnny on the on the on ramp to begin to see what's going on inside him. Same thing with Logan is me, right? And, and I'll break all that down for some of you who may not know. But what I'm trying to get at is these kind of esoteric, arcane teachings of, you know, monastics and dusty books, they actually help and they're actually, and it actually works. But we need to train, we need to do the work and translating it. Um, I would add to you this, this analogy I like to give, you know, um, as a father, um, of eight children, it would be unconscionable for me to come home when they're hungry and just throw down raw chicken on the table and say bon appetit, right? Um, I have to go, I have to buy the chicken, bring it home. My wife and I will season it, cook it, you know, uh, prepare side dishes with it, set a table, maybe even put a runner on the table with some flowers, right? Because all that matters because I'm presenting food to my children for their nourishment, not just physically, but the run or the flowers, that's also to build the ambiance by which we have communion. The need to translate these things, the work that goes into it, you know, especially for priests, especially for youth workers, especially for parents, it's the same work that a loving parent puts in to prepare a, a delicious meal together as a family. Look at it that way, okay? So very quickly, St. Justin the Martyr, he says, the soul itself is not a man, is not man, but is called man's soul. In the same way, the body is not called a man, but man's body. Though in himself, man is neither of these, the combination of the two is called man. God called man to life and resurrection. He did not call a part, but the whole, which is the soul and the body. This is important because many of our young people don't really understand what it means to be a human being. They don't understand that um, you don't have a soul and a body. That's what you are. That, that's what we are. And so since that's what we are, these aspects of our lives interpenetrate each other. And our society really moves us to, to, to insert dichotomies, right? Um, I, will, I will tell you, you know, uh, as um, someone who worked in the, as a mental health professional, um, you know, there are realities where people need medication. That's a, that's a reality. But at the same time, there's people who throw medication at everything. There's a balance that needs to be struck for those who would be in the church. And I think that balance gets lost because people fall into too much of a materialist mindset where they ignore the reality of the soul and the spirit and what's happening. And that's where this translation and, and leading to the tradition and, and finding the tools of the church to help reorder um, 
our loved ones and ourselves first and foremost is necessary. So that's what a human person is. Let's get into what our emotions. Father Dimitri Stanley, he says, the element of bodily effect, affectivity or emotionality, which grows from the biological side, isn't condemnable. It's not bad. And we must not struggle against it because it constitutes the basis of our growth in the spiritual life. St. Maximus, in agreement with the whole of Eastern asceticism, isn't an opponent of biological life. Asceticism means, in the spirit of Eastern thought, the restraint and discipline of the biological, not a battle for its extermination. On the contrary, asceticism means the sublimation of this element of bodily affectivity, not its abolition. Christianity doesn't save man from a certain part of his nature, but it saves him as a whole. The power manifested in these natural passions is also tapped to serve man in the ascent to God, it's natural, to God in natural passions, consume a spiritual character given increased ascent to our love for God. Essentially, I want to give you guys a way of understanding this, right? Think of emotions like angels, okay? God created us with emotions, right? But because of the fall, um, the messengers can be fallen. Now, I put in their parentheses traumatic experience because although trauma is a term that can oftentimes be misappropriated and used too flippantly, the reality is, is that something becomes traumatic when a person's not able to properly absorb what's happened to them. So there is a subjective measure to it that we have to be careful of. So in other words, you know, I kind of alluded to this earlier. We have to be careful to say to Jenny, why are you so upset about that? You know, it's not like someone came in and, you know, shot up your school. Why are you so upset about it? You got to be careful because oftentimes what's happening to our children, what happened to a young person, we can miss the kind of underlying context of where they're at. And it can actually have an effect on them more profound than you realize. Something that seemingly is innocuous to you as an adult who's been through something different from a, genera from a different generation, you may not understand that something may actually be at least to that child at that point in their life traumatic, meaning they, they're not able to process it in a way that they're growing from it. So anyways, <clears throat> angels are like, emotions like angels. Now, just kind of like a little fun thing, especially for any of you who listen to like um, uh, the Lord of the Spirits or anything like that. But, you know, angels are interesting because uh, the holy angels, you know, Michael, Raphael, Uriel, you know, the archangels, our, our guardian angels and such, um, their whole existence is to serve God as messengers. Angelos, Greek, it means messenger. That's what the wings are for, the, it, to give us the message, you know, the symbol of, of, of swiftness and, and mobility. That's what they do. They bring God's word to us and throughout the universe, okay? Conversely, the demons... Uh, not so much, right? And the demons who left their original appointment, um, they, fundam they fundamentally wish to usurp the authority of God, and they fundamentally want to be worshipped. They want to be given adoration and attention. So emotions in many ways function like this. Um, we have our, our emotions, um, and they can serve to give us good insight into what's going on with us. But they can also, because due to uh, a traumatic experience or, or something happening to you, your emotional responses can become dysregulated. And then what happens is your emotional responses begin to communicate to you and you begin to interpret them in ways that are untrue. And so what happens is we can begin to give worship or attention in many ways to our to these fallen angels, these bad emotions that have gone gone awry. If that analogy is making sense, okay. So, key to the translation here, right? Emotions are there for our natural survival. When our experience of our emotions becomes habitually irrational and destructive, then we're beginning to experience the passions. So again, although. Um, we're not speaking of passions specifically and explicitly. This is an on-ramp for young Johnny to begin to understand and begin to start entering into as he gets older, 
what the church is teaching about the passions. So, for example, understand that God's given us emotions for a reason. But because of trauma, because of some sort of error, some sort of aberration in our, in, in, in our lives, these emotions may or may not function accordingly. So, for instance, as you see here, this nice little graphic I have, you know, the angel and the demon. Anger, right? Anger is there to teach us that something's wrong. There's been a violation, right? Um, Ephesians 4, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. The fathers are clear. Anger is given to us. The sense of power is given to us to fight against evil, to fight against things that are wrong. But in a fallen state, in a fallen condition, and in a time or in a state in which someone's suffering from emotional dysregulation, for whatever level, rage, instead of anger, it's rage, malice, indiscriminate violence. That indiscriminate violence just isn't physical violence. It's yelling at people, calling names, ac accusatory statements, right? That's also a type of violence and abuse. Proverbs 29 says, a fool gives full vent to a spirit but a wise man quietly holds it back. So this full vent can cause, instead of a warm fire to warm yourself on a cold night, the whole village burns down. Understand anger like that, okay? Sadness. Sadness is there to tell us that there's a loss of something precious. Sadness, interestingly enough, is also the building block of appreciation. You begin to appreciate the lo through loss, actually. It's one of the ways that it works in, a, in a, a positive way. Second Corinthians, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And so that inversion, if you will, would be depression. Depression is never good. Sadness has benefits. Sadness has a purpose. Depression is crushing. It's collapsing in on oneself. Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? This kind of loss in yourself, it's some of the worst things that a person can find themselves in. And I would just say, without trying to be sensational or dramatic, here, please hear me when I, when I share this with you. Um, this is the on-ramp to, unfortunately, things like suicide. Despair is the worst of the quote unquote passions, it's the worst of emotions, because it's, a, it's an absence, complete absence of hope. And if it goes on too long, people find themselves in very, very difficult situations. Okay, so still in defining terms, what are the passions? Well, Philotheos of Sinai, he says, passion in the strict sense, uh, they define as that which lurks impassionately in the soul over a long period. Father Stephen Freeman, he had an interesting way of putting, he says, the passions are the energies or desires of our soul or body that have at their root a right and proper end. But because of the fall, they are disordered and misdirected, seeking after what they can never have. As such, they are not to be confused with emotions per se, though the emotions too have a proper role and can be distorted into a passionate, incorrect state. So here's some key things to understand that to kind of pull all that together. Passions are caused by turning the various faculties of the soul and body away from God and directing them towards sensible reality to seek pleasure in them. This is a nice little way of a shorthand of saying what I just said, there's idolatry, essentially. That's what idolatry does to you, okay? Um, another point, we experience passion as and through, right? We experience passions as and through emotions, but not all emotions are passions. Very important here, right? Um, in our tradition, you know, in regards of passions, I could say this to you: um, all passions are sins, but not all. Uh, but not, uh, all passions are sins, but not all sins are passions, right? All passions are sins, but not all sins are passions. So, in other words, the habitual nature is the issue. That's that's the problem when something becomes habitual. That's when you're moving into the realm of the passions. Versus just a, a, a sin, right? And especially versus just an, kind of like a, 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 an off day with your emotions. So there's two kinds of passions according to the fathers, natural passions 
and the unnatural passion. Natural passions, they depend on nature and not the will. Okay, so it's kind of like the more animalistic aspect of our being. Um, appetite for food, fear of being harmed, sexual attraction, they're, 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 these things are not bad um, and they're necessary to preserve our nature. So they're not a problem as long as the need for self preservation they don't go beyond the need for self-preservation. Now, the unnatural passions, these, excuse me, these are natural passions that we mistakenly connect with our longing for spiritual wholeness. Again, the idolatry, this is, this is the component. We continually seek happiness only to find pain on the other end. Then feeling pain or dissatisfaction, we again seek more pleasure only again to find again pain. This is the, the famous pain pleasure cycle of St. Maximus, okay? He says, St. Maximus, by the way, uh, when man isn't focused on distinguishing between what is spiritual and things of the senses, he disobeys the divine command. He errs. When the irrationality of feeling is the only form of discernment, he is captured by pleasure and avoidance of pain. And I will tell you from experience, this is the thing you see over and over again. That in a nutshell, my brothers and sisters, is what addiction is. It is the pursuit of a pleasure to escape pain. And that pursuit of pleasure does not fulfill, thus the cycle has to begin. The pain of that lack of fulfillment is why people continue the addiction cycle, okay? Father, we have, I think, a question. Yes. I'm gonna allow Susan to talk if you wanna ask her question, Susan. You have to unmute yourself to do it. So there's Susan. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Susan, put your question in the question area and we will answer it as soon as we can. Go ahead, Father. But let me let me uh, jump in, Father, since we, we took a little break there. Uh, amen to everything you're saying. This is so good. And um, I'm thinking of the, you mentioned the 12 steps and why that's so useful. 12 step literature talks about addiction as instincts gone awry, right? So the, it, it all takes something that God created good for our preservation. And then it gets gummed up, right? It gets, it gets sent off the deep end. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, so that leads us to what are feelings, okay? Now, remember everyone, we're going back and forth. We're, we're going from terms that young people will know, terms that most people will know, and then we're, we're diving deeper into the patristic understanding of, and trying to make a, an on-ramp, okay? So feelings, right? So feelings are influenced by our emotions, and, but are generated from our mental thoughts. They are, the raw, they are the interpretation of the raw data of our emotions. These interpretations are influenced and compromised of our personal context, which are then processed by our worldview. So in other words, someone says, ah, you know, I'm just feeling like you don't care about me, right? Well, that's the way that they're interpreting the signals from their body, their brain, the inner heart. This is, this is what's happening. But people in the, in the common vernacular say, I just feel like, or I'm feeling, okay? Um, the key translation here is that all thoughts do not originate with us. Um, and this is where the opportunity and need arises in bringing forward the patristic term of logismi, right? Most young people don't know what this is. And so being able to explain to them, you know, not every feeling, every kind of thought with, and with sensation that you have is from you there are demonic impressions that can come. And it isn't just a little demon on your shoulder going like, you know, look at pornography or, you know, disobey your parents. In many ways, these logismi are, are almost built into the structure of society, depending on what kind of ads they're looking at or what kind of influence is coming from the music they're listening to. This is another kind of type of way of understanding logismi. So what are logos me? Well, according to St. Maximus, this is, and again, forgive me, everyone, I'm just trying to, I know most of you already probably know this, I'm just kind of giving a cursory um, you know, definition of it, but 
Logos mean essentially their images together with thoughts. Okay. Um, so all things have their inner principle, like log logoi, like they have this core essence of what they are, right? Everything does. Um, and these communicate to man on an imperceptible level. This is gets into our news and how we perceive things and interact with reality. Okay. Um, some thoughts are simple and some are composite. So one versus many. Um, thoughts not linked with passions, they're simple. Whereas passion charged thoughts are composite. These are what the father's speaking on when they use the term uh, look as me. So for instance, gold, woman, man, car. These are things, okay? The simple memory of gold, et cetera, is a conceptual image, right? You can, you can understand that, right? Think of your favorite car when you were 18, okay? You can see it. That's an image, right? Passion is then the mindless affectation or indiscriminate hatred for one of those same things, right? So for instance... My car when I was 18 was a 1976 Ford Maverick. Great car. But that car, I can have the type of association with it. Thank you so much. I can have the type of association with it and be reminded of um, a terrible, um, you know, my ex-girlfriend at the time and the terrible breakup because she cheated on me. You understand what I'm saying? And now I can have a very odd response to a Ford Maverick. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but if you begin to understand how having the link between your interpretation of your experience linked with something else, this is this is as me, and it can cause real damage with people. Um, let me let me give one more. I'm sorry if I'm belaboring, but I think this is important. People who suffer from um, a kind of racist tendency. They're suffering from a logis me, right? They'll see someone, they'll go like, oh, that person's a Greek. And there's a Greek priest who was cruel to me because I was, you know, from Nicaragua or whatever, right? And therefore, that image of a Greek person, a Greek priest, right, coupled with your bad experience, right? Because you're not discerning correctly. You're not discerning that was it was, you know, Father Nicholas, you're just making it just Greek priests in general. Therefore, now you've coupled your bad experience with the picture of all Greek priests, and now you have a passion. Every time you see a Greek priest, you think of Father Nicholas, your heart begins to race, your pulse goes up, your sweat, your eye, your pupils dilate, right? Log is me, right? And the way that it affects us, okay? Ultimately, these are the flaming arrows of the demons, right? These are what they use to really unseat us from sobriety and from the peace that Christ has for us. Okay, so real quick, uh, differences between feelings and emotions, okay? Well, the brain and the body, the nervous system are taking in this, the sensory world around us equals emotion. Emotion comes up from the ground of, of being, it, you can't really control it. It's imperceptible to you in, in many ways how it arises. But your experience and evaluation based on your culture and situation, this is how it, this is your interpretation, feelings, right? You cannot necessarily control your emotions, but you can definitely work on having um, an orthodox interpretation. So in other words, your feelings can become in line in such a way that you have a healthy um, experience and expression of what's going on in you, okay? Just a couple examples of where um, emotion is problematic. Excuse me. Scriptures, Cain and Abel, full of anger, hatred towards his brother, right? His anger ruling him. Remember the Lord says to him, sin is crouching at your door. It wishes to master over you. What was the sin? this disease in our tradition sin is understood more accurately as a disease versus exclusively kind of moral decision there is a moral component to sin but the fathers teach it as it's really to be understood in a better way as disease so when you have that in mind then when you think about cain you know, being overtaken by this thing, 
sin, it starts to make more sense. I can go on. Moses, the meekest man on earth at one point in time, right? This very thing, the loss of his meekness caused him to strike the rock instead of speaking to it. Elijah, Elijah suffering from depression and this depression undermining the faith in God. God guiding him, teaching him, instructing him, giving him victory over the priests of Baal. And then the very next movement, he's running and scared, even though he's just one. His emotions undermining the power that he was operating in. Solomon, his quest for happiness and wisdom, life's meaning, right? This lust led him to ruin. And this is in many ways probably one of the better examples for youth, especially for young people. And the, when they're starting to develop their bodies, they're starting to feel sexual urges. They're starting to feel the desire to be recognized. So they'll do odd things to make sure that the opposite sex or that their peers are recognizing them and thus leading them into some real ruin. Jeremiah and his depression, again, very much like Elijah, undermining the reality of the power that he was to operate in. And forgive me if this sounds too charismatic, if this sounds sensational, but I think it's important to understand. Um, each one of the children that before you, uh, they have power. They have power that they can operate in. And I think, we, I think we do them an injustice if we act like that's not the case. We must remind our children and, and, and inculcate in them the value that's inherent in them because of God's love. Let me give you an example. You know, the kind of birds and the bees talk that, you know, parents will give to the children. The one that I give to my kids is very simple. I let them know that they have the power of God inside them to bring life. If you choose to use that power, you know, I'm a comic book nerd guy too. So I often quote the Spider-Man movies, but I'll say, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? My kids, they grew up on Spider-Man and stuff. So I say, look, this is a real thing. If you choose to use this power to bring life, to create life, and you don't honor that gift in the proper way, you're creating a potential villain in the world. There's an old African proverb that says, the child that doesn't feel the love of the village around the fire will burn the village down. And I will tell you, um, and I've told, as I've told my children, living in a poor neighborhood, you know, just to be frank, a poor black neighborhood in Kansas City, much of the pain around here comes from children in, from broken homes. I know that's not popular. People don't want to hear it. But when children do not have the support that they all deserve, there is a resentment that can come. And from that, all kinds of social problems develop. It's just a fact. We have to let our children know that the power inside them isn't just for sport, whether it's sex or their, or their ability to to perform at sports or get a job, make money, whatever it is, they have to be responsible. And if their emotions are leading them in a way that would be irresponsible, we have to encourage them. The reason and the need is because of the good gift of power and ability within them. So a kind of little um, schema or a little bit of a kind of a formula that I've developed here to kind of just make it simple, but emotions become feelings, okay? This is on the immaterial level. Emotions then become behavior. So at this point now, the immaterial aspect, what's moving inside the feeling, right? It has a greater effect on the material, which is the body. But very quickly, behaviors will become habits. And now we're at a purely material level. We're dealing with like, bodily reaction to things. And these things are happening over and over again. Like, this is becoming habitual and then habits become passions. And this is now where we begin to lead into a point where um, either the young person or the person in front of us, whoever it is, and if they aren't guided to a path of understanding what repentance is, 
this is this is the path of destruction and that doesn't have to sound you know kind of antiquated that looks like addiction that looks like broken marriages that looks like an inability to function with integrity at a job i can go on and on and on of how these things if they if they are not looked at and the, the passions develop it causes real problems for people okay so now we're into the application stage descending so as you all know adam gave names to all <laughs> the cattle the birds of the air every beast okay um you know part of our vocation um as the children of adam is to bring into order the things that surround and involve our lives right the beasts of the air and of the sea right if you're understanding um how i'm connecting them symbolically right beasts are a symbol of you know, um, service, work, right? Um, so our lives are or should be in such a way that these, are, these things are being ordered rightly, okay? Um, but these also includes our inner life, our emotions, our feelings. Um, and by properly identifying what's happening within us, we can fulfill uh, this vocation. Now, in my work with dealing with people who suffer from trauma, one of the first things I do is I start giving them a greater vocabulary for their feelings. Um, when someone is unable to articulate themselves, they begin to suffer from a level of frustration that is oftentimes, forgive me for saying this, I know I'm using the word a lot, but imperceptible to themselves. And when you're talking about emotions, it's really important to understand this phenomena of being imperceptible to the person. It's really key because you have to realize oftentimes when people are in emotional states, they really don't realize what's happening to them. I'm not trying to exonerate people. Quite the opposite, actually. What I'm talking about is, is trying to give people agency, actually, and trying to get them to where they can actually take responsibility for what's happening in them. And so by teaching young people, especially that big feelings can lead to real problems and by showing them how working first with their sensations means they can intervene before they become too overwhelming, we are in fact giving them agency, okay? So one way of doing this is asking what our emotions are trying to tell us, right? In what way could they be a useful signal to us, right? Ecclesiastes says there's a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Now, remember, the title of this talk is Let Them Serve You. And the reason why the title of the talk is that is because it's not about, as we, you know, hopefully it was communicated, um, you know, through the quote from Father Demetri Stanley on all this good stuff, is that. This isn't about getting rid of emotions. I spent a lot of time dealing with this, just with my parish, you know, um, dealing with helping people reach a level of emotional maturity because people, especially sometimes converts, they get excited and they hear all these terms, passions and look as me and like all this stuff. And it's like, man, you can't even handle your wife telling you that you did a bad job taking the trash out you know what i mean like that like i don't really want to hear from you about you know the passions if you can't kind of like be mature in your interactions with people you know what i mean um and that's on the that's on a real normal level that's not even getting to people i have a significant you know i don't say significant let's just put it this way um you know, the, my parish is my, our patron, St. Mary of Egypt, right? Um, from my perspective, she's the saint of repentance. So I have a lot of people here working through really difficult things in my parish, really difficult things, okay? Um, this emotional development that I'm speaking of it's probably one of the greatest tools in, in them being able to begin to approach repentance. But this has to be done first, right? Father, I was thinking, uh, even before you brought this this uh, graph up with uh, different words for emotions so we could get vocabulary, I think we're partly hamstrung even by our own language because, because English in particular is this, you know, 
layers and layers of old languages. And so we've lost the connection to the original words, which tended to be a lot closer to the embodied experience. Like if you look at the Hebrew words for like anger, the word basically means flaring nose. You know, it's every and, and throughout the scriptures, we see, like you said, it's the passions or sins are not simple moral things they're a disease you see that more clearly in the in the older languages because there's that embodied quality to describing them they're 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 seen as an experience which happens not just in the mind but in the whole person yes and i think so so getting people just to even even if they don't know what the word is for the feeling to be able to know what it feels like bottle to describe where does it hurt in your body when yes. you think this Yes. Uh, and that and getting in touch with that is really important. And it's a great point, Father, because um, I, I will tell you, there's a great book um, called The Body Keeps the Score. Yeah. And again, I just forgive me. I will tell you from experience, not just my own personal experience. You know, I, I experienced this, you know, um, I don't get it as much. But, you know, thanks. My mother died um, three days before Thanksgiving. Right or around that time, I can, you know, there's certain things that just in it and, and forgive me how this sounds. I'm not even thinking about mom. Sometimes I got eight kids. I got a, a, you know, parish of hundreds of people. You know what I mean? I'm not thinking always about my mom around that time, but all of a sudden what's go. Oh, Oh, the body keeps the score. Um, so many of the women in my parish who've been assaulted sexually, you know, and the way that they, you know, when they're young women, now they're, you know, older, the way that was never dealt and, and, and healed and the way they carry that in their body. It's a very real phenomenon. Yeah. Very real. Okay. So the prodigal must return. Interesting. You know, we're familiar with this with, um, oh, excuse me, the uh, prodigal son. And uh, this portion here, it says, and when he came to himself, right, he came to himself how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. Excuse me. Understanding emotional maturity as the process of returning our emotions to the original intention of our heavenly father. So I gave you one example of understanding our emotions as angels. They can either be good angels or bad angels. Now in the process of how do we kind of take this, let's start looking at, the emotions of a person, um, I mean, simply put as, you know, the prodigal returning, okay? Oh, let me see, there's a question here. Uh, Father Turbo, sometimes for parents, it seems less difficult for a parent to present a good witness for other people's children. Our own children show us failures, and this seems consistent, whether we are cradle, convert, only orthodox, and the family parents. Can you speak to the tension for us who would like to act as youth leaders but yet can't claim to have holy orthodox family for various reasons. Yes, I would gladly like to address that. Um, I think one of the things that needs to happen, and, and forgive me if this is not really addressing uh, what you're saying. Um, I think one of the things that needs to happen is there's a measure of humility and patience we have to have with ourselves. Um, Forgive me how this sounds. Uh, I think someone could interpret any priest as he has the answers to everything. Um, and I think the fact of the matter is, is that's just simply patently not true. And I think that as a father, as a biological father, I have ample opportunity to apologize. I have ample opportunity to say to my sons and my daughters, I actually really don't know. And I have found, this is something that, this is something the Lord really impressed on my heart very early on when I had my first son. I need to have humility. I wasn't even Orthodox yet. I need to have humility when it's time to tell them I don't know. And I've really tried to maintain that. I really have. Um, and God has shown me I need to maintain it 
not even in a kind of self-conscious sense, but just for the sake of truth. Because to be honest with you, you know, um, I don't think my older kids always appreciate that. So in other words, they don't, they don't realize that my willingness to say, I don't know, isn't me trying to cop out or not engage. It's me trying to leave room for them and leave room for God. And I think that when we begin to have that kind of experience or that understanding, excuse me, and, and forgive me, I'm a convert. What do I know? But I think that's part of what it means to be Orthodox, actually. And I think that there's, there's aspects of our faith that are very explicit in the sense of, you know, kind of culture and aesthetic and these things like that. But there is so much more that is implicit in regards of, you know, our experience, how we do the phronema, if you will. And I think that understanding the humility needed to really be a human being before our children is is the greatest orthodox example i don't know if you want to comment on that father i don't know if you think that's off but that's just yeah i think that's uh, i think that's great i would just say um especially for those who are maybe coming from a convert perspective and think that somehow they don't have some some credential or something the reality is that when you ask who can claim to have a holy orthodox family and and i and i mean that in both uses of the word holy and wh holy there's no family that has it all together we're all struggling with the kind of the 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 fragmentation of of culture and and the mind and all these thoughts and so even if we were raised in the church many cannot really say that we are wholly orthodox yet we are all in process we are all trying to figure this exact same question out honestly so you're in good company uh you know and, and like we heard in the in the epistle from saint paul last sunday you know um my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness yeah yeah i mean um I make so many mistakes. Um, I oftentimes will say things that I don't, you know, I get carried away. Um, and I think, I think there's a, a place where obviously it's not okay because I'm a priest, but at the same time, um, I try to be a man that will capitalize on that. So in other words, um, if I'm wrong on something, I, I really do want to apologize. And I really, I really do want to um, repent because I can't. I have been wrong, and I can be wrong, and I'll be wrong again. Um, and I won't always have the right answers. Um, and I think that's part of what I'm trying to say is that if I don't have emotional maturity myself, what am I going to give my? How am I going to teach someone? Right? These are these are those moments. So, is there any way to test your emotional maturity? Well, there is. Right. How did you respond to a recent stressful situation? So um, like becoming upset and fail with others and failing to acknowledge our own needs is a sign that you may need to develop in maturity, okay? This is, of course, very cursory, right? I mean, very cursory, just to give examples, right? Um, how have you coped with unexpected change? This is something I, I have dealt a lot with because I've dealt with a lot of people who are addicts and also um, people with personality disorders. Interestingly enough, Unexpected change is something that's a really big trigger for people. Okay. Um, people with emotional maturity are able to express their joy to others, even in the midst of sudden change. Um, they're not moved in such a way that their whole mood collapses, right? This, these are things that can be worked on, by the way. Are you often fed up with everyone and everything? Do you express gratitude or stay stuck in rehashing everything that's gone wrong? Can you see how others may have, uh, how others may have uh, excuse me for the typo, uh, made it worse. Um, this is important because this, this is, think of a child, right? A child who's been uh, corrected or chastised and they're just doubling down. We all know it. No, it's, it was Jimmy's fault, this and this and that, right? That's one of the telltale signs if you think of a kid throwing a tantrum, right? 
um, just being unable to get out of it and blaming everyone. This is this is this is something that sometimes people don't grow out of because they haven't been given the opportunity to really see themselves and have someone help them work on their emotional maturity. Um, when things go wrong, you usually pin the blame on others, right? We just caught, we just covered that. So these these are things that can be worked on. And again, the point that I'm trying to make in this lecture, this is the angle that I was talking about earlier is this stuff we all can kind of say, yeah, I already know that that's common sense. But the angle I'm trying to give that maybe you don't realize is this is often the impediment to people actually getting into real spiritual life is they don't, they have not approached this aspect of their life. And therefore, father is telling them things, catechism, adult education, podcasts, lectures, all that stuff, and they're not making real progress. They may be amassing information, but they're not really making progress because this kind of building block hasn't, hasn't been put into place. And so their emotions, getting back to the prodigal analogy, their emotions are still out there with the pigs. Their emotions are still out there stuck and they haven't come to the, you, they, you have not come to a place where they can call their emotion back to that place of, of being of use, right? So how can I work on my own emotional maturity? Well, you've obviously, like I mentioned, you learn to identify your emotions, right? Recognizing how you feel. This is a huge one right here. This is a the kind of liminal space of the emotions, but really getting to deep spirituality, which is learning from shame. Excuse me. I gave a homily, oh gosh, four years ago, five years ago. And I, I don't say this like bragging. I say it, it's just funny. People still talk about that homily because it was, I, I brought up um, shame and embracing shame and it, it it rocked people like i said they still talk about it because the culture has shifted in such a way that shame is this dirty 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 word now i'll make a i'll make a distinction there's toxic quote unquote shame the kind of toxic shame which leads to a um an irrational and untrue perspective of oneself okay the kind of toxic shame that says that leads to despair. Oh, you know, I, I did this bad thing and I will never be good and I just deserve to die. And that's, that's, that's not it, right? But the shame of this, what I mean, uh, to help approximate it. You know, when you're preparing for confession, there's that thing you kind of don't want to talk about. That feeling, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say this, right? That shame points you exactly where you need to talk about. You may have a five mile long list of all the stuff you have no problem saying, which may actually, this is interesting. It may actually even be worse. I've seen this where people will confess things which are egregious, you know, but there's this one thing that there's a shame surrounding, which in comparison, quote unquote, isn't as egregious as the other one. But because of their circumstance, there's something about their identity or, or something is, is tied to it and there's such shame around it. But that's exactly where the evil one has a hold on them. That's exactly where their own sin, their own passions have, have begun to cave in on them. I don't want to belabor it, but I'm going to because I think this is really key, especially for young people because shame is a very misunderstood emotion around them. And shame is oftentimes what locks, especially young girls into promiscuity, actually. There's a weird inverse reality that shameful, girls that are dealing with shame, they oftentimes, it, it sound, it's a paradox, but they oftentimes will run into promiscuity from shame, actually. And so there's this thing, um, uh, uh, Krepsis. Crepsis. What that is, it's it's when there's an accident, you have a broken a broken bone, and there's this kind of ah, ah, kind of grinding of the bone on bone that can happen. I know it sounds gruesome, but this is this is a phenomenon. So let me give you an example. 
there's a accident on the side of the road you're driving by, right? And terrible accident, you know, the, the driver though, you see them sitting on the side of the road. There's no obvious contusions, blood, no, you know, no bones sticking out. So the paramedic, he'll, he'll go and look, don't see anything, but then the paramedic will go and begin to touch the person uh, that was in the accident. And he's looking for, ah, ah, right? He can't see the bone protruding, but the pain that the person responds to. And then, you know, he touches it and he can feel the kind of grinding of the bone on bone. He knows, okay, that's where there needs to be healing. Think of the, that crepitus, that, that crepsis, that bone on bone, that, that's the same thing as shame. And, and so emotional maturity helps someone to become conscious that feeling bad can actually be the agency to make change, to not run from it. And this is our tradition. Our tradition is, is to not flinch and to lean into these things. And this is, this is the cross. This is the cross, okay? Take ownership of your reality. Look at your life and take full responsibility. This is something that, you know, every parent, every youth worker, every mentor is trying to engender into their the people around them, but it, 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 it's, it is the key. It is one of the keys to emotional health, right? Observe others with curiosity. This is an interesting one because what happens is we oftentimes observe others and we become irritated, right? We become judgmental. We become all these things. One of the best ways to circumvent that is learning to uh, employ curiosity because Sometimes I would say, I'll say to some of my, especially some of my daughters, uh, my spiritual daughters who struggle with judgment, judging, you know, the thought is called cunning as well. You know, you think you know what someone's motivations are, this or that. And just saying like, well, you may not be able to stop the judging, but you can at least take that energy and redirect it. You could at least take that energy instead of thinking like, what is the bad motivations? Look at that person in a way to understand them and enter into communion with them and to be with them, to help with them. This is, again, what I mean about learning to have them serve you. This is about taking emotional movements, which you can't necessarily control, but converting them in a way that they be service to you. The prodigal leaving the pigs, coming home to be with the father again. Okay? Follow someone else's lead. Finding a reliable role model. Saints, godparents, spiritual father. Right. These are all things that can um, help us develop and help the young person develop. These are points that you can point to so that they can, excuse me, develop their emotional maturity. Finally, Metropolitan Arteos Flacos, he says, thus within the church, we struggle to transform all emotions as well as everything mundane. The transformation of emotions to genuine and authentic experience is accomplished by repentance. Repentance leads us from a painful and tragic monologue to a dialogue with the living God. Through repentance, self-condemnation, and humility, we transform emotions to spiritual experiences. In this case also holds true what we mentioned about fantasy, right? The more a person is emotionally ill, the more he reveals the death and darkness of his noose. And the more a person's emotions are transformed, the more his noose is illumined. He's at a state of illumination, okay? So this is where the tradition really begins to lead and take us out of these approximations of definition, the translations of emotions, and now working into passions, feelings into logos. This is where the tradition starts to come into play. Tradition helps us in these areas. You know, prayer, it purifies the mind, it trains the soul. Fasting is a means towards self-control and the balance of the whole person. What I mean by that is, yes, you know, it's like I tell the young men here, you're, it's going to be hard for you to say no to porn if you can't say no to the meat pizza on Friday, right? There's something to that, okay? Our bodies have an impact on our emotional states as well. Um, forgive me, we're adults. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you guys. You know, women, if their progesterone levels drop, right, it can have an effect on their emotions. So certain, certain women need to up their iron intake around certain times of the month to help them not be so subject to their emotional fluctuations. This is, these are practical steps to help mitigate 
the the fallout that can happen with um you know out of control motions okay finally confession it, it's the means by which a person's wounds are revealed by which both prayer and asceticism are prescribed ultimate love the key thing is, is is just getting people to a point where they begin to understand the power of love and this is i think and forgive me if this sounds too try to do Pollyannish, but for me, ultimately, that's what orthodoxy is, is, is about giving the person every means to attain and, and, and experience and understand, what, understand love. This is, this, is, this is the end goal. This is in a nutshell. St. Simeon Metaphasis, he says, love bears with all things, patiently accepts all things, love never fails, quoting 1 Corinthians. This phrase never fails, makes it clear that unless they have been granted total deliverance from the passions through the most complete and active love of the spirit, even those who have received spiritual gifts are still liable to falter. They are still in danger, must struggle in fear against the attacks launched on them by the spirits of evil. St. Paul shows that not to be in danger of falling or liable to passion is such a lofty state that the tongues of angels prophesy all knowledge and gifts of healings are nothing compared to it. Listen, ultimately what we want to teach our, our young people is that anything that is in the way of us genuinely experiencing the love of God, which is found in the love of our brother and our sister, and also in the love of God himself through, the, through our life in the church and our repentance, anything that gets in the way of that, we have to bring it into captivity to Christ. We have to bring it into captivity of our own, forgive me for this term, but the wielding of our own spirit in Christ. This is what I mean by also that power. This isn't done by shaming people in the wrong way. This isn't done by, you know, telling people how much they're failing. It's about reminding them of their agency and helping them to understand, no, this can be done. And there are ways for you to mature, to get a hold of these things. It feels like you don't have any control, but in Christ and together, you do. We do. I'll help you. I'll be with you, right? These are some practical things. That's a conversation, something to that degree. So thank you. That's, that's my presentation. There's any questions? Thank you, Father. That was awesome. Um, I have to say it's it's this is a question I ask myself all the time, and you're you're doing some really good work, and that is how do we translate the faith to the, to the language that people actually live in, right? So that they they will be able to start to implement these patristic concepts without getting lost in the jargon and the Greek words and all the things that we have plenty of in Orthodoxy, right? But uh, I never thought of describing logis me as feelings. And now that I think about it, it makes perfect sense. Because when I'm talking with my teenager, for example, or something like that, if I were to ask her, what were you thinking or what are you thinking? Uh, there's a switch that goes off and she goes to a, you know, just like I would or anybody would to a place in their head where they're going thinking what was the thought process logical you know and the fact is that's that that's not where that stuff is happening it's actually happening at that level of feelings where those feelings are okay what is can you can you express what the feeling is telling you and that's when you get to it like my feeling is telling me um there's no hope for me or i'm nobody will ever love me or uh i'm never going to succeed at this i'm not good at it or whatever it is that and even though that's not what i would call a feeling i would call that a, you know i because i've got this you know logius meat stuff in my i'm thinking that's an intrusive thought you know but <laughs> right. nobody says that in every day right right nobody says that nobody but, says that yeah but if you said if you find it where it, it lives in your feelings mm -hmm. in the in terms of everyday parlance i think that's absolutely brilliant and uh, and this the, a lot of these quotes are great because I never really made the connection as much with the emotions too with all of this uh, as clearly as you have tonight. And so uh, we have a, we have in our parish um, a book study where we've been reading the Philokalia. We started with Saint John Climacos and we've read some other things, but we've been reading. We're in I guess what we're one of, one of them on the on the call today. I think it's I think we're in volume three already. Uh, of the Philokalia, but I'm going to have them, I'm going to send them the link to this and have them watch this because they're like, oh my gosh, this will like, this will like reframe everything we've been reading in a way that will might actually 
hope open your whole mind as oh yeah okay now i see like you you laid out maximus and the conceptual images idea in the most simplistic way ever that i'm like oh duh <laughs> Yeah. And that is super useful. So yeah, I mean these Incredible. concepts aren't they're they they're 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 lost in translation to a certain extent, uh, you know, and obviously because of the the theological traditions involved and, and all that, but but they reflect reality that every single human being experiences. Every single human being. So okay, well we have a question for you. Oh, here's a great question. What is the earliest age at which you introduce these concepts? Some seem fairly sophisticated. So, or you could ask, how would you introduce these concepts at the earliest stage or something? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I, I'm talking to my six-year-old about these things, you know, and forgive me uh, if you think that uh, I've done a good job in presenting it in a simple manner. It's because I, I'm doing it. It's, I'm actually doing it now with my own young children. I'm doing it now with the children of the parish. Every Wednesday, I have a liturgy for the school and I give a homily for the kids. And, the, and so it's very important to me. And I work on breaking these things down, you know, not just throwing raw chicken on the table for them, you know. So I would say that. Um, one of the key things to kind of discern when you can is, do you understand what the young person is saying in front of you? What, what, are, the lang what are the terms that they're using? Because if you can begin to understand what they're saying, then you can do the work of translating it like for them or begin the translation for them. Does that make sense? So, I, I mean, honestly, I would say the second that a child starts talking about their feelings and motivating them in, in what they're doing, they're ready because they already they're already understanding the concept of of um to be frank provocation we would call it in, in a neptic context provocation they're already they're already experiencing it knowing it you know yeah with my teenager i like to use the word trigger trigger <laughs> yep i'm triggered <laughs> yep, that's it that's it yeah, they have they have a they actually do have an entire lexicon. Each generation, I think, develops yes. a lexicon of how to describe this these internal realities. And that's how they can communicate those aha moments to each other where I'm feeling what you're feeling, or I, I'm ex having the exact experience that you're having in reaction to what I'm hearing or seeing like that. And that's that creates the bonding that they have. Yes, each other that they have these this not only a shared experience but a shared kind of uh, lexicon of their generation. So we have a we have a comment in the chat uh, that was sent to us. So uh, this is again about shame, and I'll share it uh, for the for the group. Sometimes there is just an overall sense of shame, something that is difficult to deal with even in confession. It isn't only young people who experience this. I do think young people should know that some of us older people know and uh, know what this is like and how that is like. I think, I think that's absolutely true. Being able as, as an adult to also speak in a way that they're gonna say, I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. I, they understand what I'm going through in some way, right? Because we can say, I understand, but to actually say, I feel this and they can hear themselves and us. Yes. It's very powerful. Forgive me, Father, um, if I could just say something uh, just to kind of like come at a different angle from what you said. Sure. Communion. You know, one of the things that I'm trying to do, but I'm personally trying to do better at is being conscious of the desire for communion that that people have. And in my own inability to kind of be vulnerable, my own ego, protect my own ego and all that stuff, I cut off people's desire for communion because I'm, I'm triggered or I'm threatened or I feel like you're not respecting my authority or you're, you know, you don't understand what I'm saying. You know what I mean? All these things can happen. And I think that when I have remembered that desire for communion that that person's wanting, even they, they wouldn't phrase it that way right 
it helps me to do what I need to do. It helps me to be Christ-like to them. It helps me to, you know, begin to enter into a, you know, a kind of canonic state, if I could say that, you know, like they are looking for that. They don't even know it at that moment. But I, but if I recognize it, then I'm able to do what I need to do. And when, and when I then, you know, allow myself to kind of like die, God does some really amazing things, you know, um, I'll just share with everybody, you know, some of my most contentious moments with my older kids, they've never been resolved by them saying, I'm sorry, dad, I offended you. I'm sorry, dad, I disrespected you. They've never been resolved like that. They've always been resolved by the spirit awakening in me, this need to humble myself, even though I was the one who was wronged and open myself back up to them. And then something moves in them. There's a softness at hand, that repentance, something they return to themselves and then they want to return to their father. So I just think that's, a, that's something to kind of think about because um, the need to really experience that is also a problem that we can sometimes not be aware of what's going on in the other person. Does that make sense what I was saying? Uh, it hits me in a whole bunch of places. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and communion is actually the ex best way to talk about it because, um, I think when people fall away from faith and from church, this dynamic is happening as well, right? There's this, there's this inability to, to, to be vulnerable, to make that connection. And it takes the church to take the first step and humble itself and come and say, you know, we love you. We want to be in communion with you. We want to share this life with you. Um, you know, you'll never, you'll never get it by them coming and saying, you know, I was wrong. You <laughs> know, uh, I humble myself. Maybe, maybe life kicks them around enough and they come back to church, but usually it's, it's, it's the church has to do something to show humility and vulnerability first. So yeah yeah um forgive me uh caleb uh in regards of um actionable resources to recommend um i'm failing here i really don't have any um and i, I say that um uh, just because the majority of this really has come from my own kind of personal study and um experience so i don't have like a book that I can say, oh, get this book on emotional development or anything like that um, in particular. Um, but um, I would say, um, you know, practicing humility and love is you know, the kind of best thing, I, I don't know. Yeah, there's plenty of like good titles within the spiritual tradition that we could, you know. Yes, consider, yes. Right? I think uh, one of the books I always make people put on their list is uh elder thaddeus oh yeah our thoughts determine our lives our thoughts determine our lives because right there the title kind of will give you half this lesson yeah. right there yeah very good very good yeah yeah when you put in that in that and that that's that's a great one actually that is a great one um yeah forgive me i'm just a little stumped right now but um it's it's hard because it's a it's actually you know I'm trying to think, you know, Bessel van der Kolk came out and a lot of these, a lot of this really good stuff on shame and trauma and everything. It's really only been what in the last 10 years or something. It's, it's, it is very recent. It is very recent. I mean, again, the, the, the author that I was talking about the by keeps the score. That's, that's the book that I mentioned earlier. Forgive me. Um, that's a great one. Um, there's another book which may sound like it's not relevant, but it is. It's called uh, Nonviolent Communication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's another great one. Um, uh, oh goodness. Um, yeah, if 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 maybe when I get another cup of coffee and I get some piss inspiring, I'll send father an email and he can send it to you. Caleb, forgive me. I apologize. 
Sure. Well, Father, it's it's nine thirty four, so we've had a, a good hour and a half, which is wonderful. Uh, if anyone has any last questions, speak now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise, you can always find Father Turbo on the on the vast uh, interwebs and uh, or at his parish in Kansas City with all the good work that he is doing. So this was this was fantastic, Father. I did a I did a I did a webinar on Tuesday with my parish uh, with Father Stephen Muse about trauma. Oh, wonderful! And it's oh, like man, his I mean, book, All Hearts of Flame. That's a great one too. Yeah, like your talk, his talk, and your talk are like two bookends for this week for me. And I'm like, I hope to God he is that God is not trying to prepare me for some like big thing because all of what I've been hearing and, and learning this week has been so good and so useful that I'm uh, that I'm like, I, I'd like to just digest it for a while <laughs> yeah. before I have to put it into use. Cause I know, I know in the, in the priesthood we do and in youth ministry, we have to, we we're working with this stuff all the time, all the time, father, all the time. So wonderful. Just thank you for this opportunity. And um, yeah, I, I hope, I hope this is this will be a service to people. And, and again, forgive me if I wasn't succinct or if something didn't make sense. So it's very good, Father. God bless you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us on the call tonight. Uh, this will be made available online probably within the next few days. And uh, it'll be up on our Orthodox 